day. For every declaration we have, it is a universal value. Okay, that has been adopted at the United Nations. That can be ignored. Yeah, that can be ignored. So when you have a declaration, all right, there are issues of contention, which, for example, nations can then object to and not find to the various declarations within the, the rights itself. But I think John was actually saying that in this society, we don't seem to have internalized the importance of civil rights to human rights. Is that what you're trying to say? Not so much at a global level. Is that, I, I understand you correctly? Yes, please. Yeah, but, but I think that's the point, isn't it? Uh, like, maybe the question isn't why gay people shouldn't be accorded equal civil rights with non-gay people. Maybe the question is, why should gay people be accorded equal civil rights to non-gay people? That's the question. Why so should you? Answer that. Say, try, try to answer your own I question. wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> but that's the question. You're asking for civil rights. Tell me why you should have equal civil rights. What governs your right to an equal civil right? That's the fundamental question. Not why you don't get equal civil rights, but why you should get equal civil rights. What governs that? What determines that? How do you decide that? So, Okay, I'm going to frame it a slightly differently. And maybe this is going to be a little bit contentious. In fact, I think it's going to be very contentious. In my view, what is holding us back from changing these laws, from repealing these laws, is religion. Okay, and it's evangelical Christians and the fundamental um, Muslims who are holding us back. And it's a very small minority, but it's a very vocal and very visible minority. They write to the papers, they, they mobilize their flock to protest anything, even when he said, was it was Go Chok Tong who said, we are going to hire uh, civil servants, um, gay civil servants, right? Uh, there was a huge letter writing campaign protesting that from the church in Singapore. Now these are the Anglicans, these are the archbishops who are fighting against the US archbishop for ordaining gay, gay bishops. They are the ones who are really conservative. So much so that, to my knowledge, um, the Home Affairs actually clamped down on the, on the church and made them read out a statement saying, we will not interfere with Singapore politics. Okay, that's how far it got. But it really is, I can't remember, the ex lord de dean of law, I think. Oh, yeah. Yes, and her, and her daughter. Okay, mother and daughter. The, the, that couple and a few other people who are extremely vociferous and vocal against gay people, amongst other things. Okay, and it's those people who are in, in effect holding us back from, from, from Yeah, I don't I don't think sometimes I think I think we cannot help uh, the discussion if we go too far in the first year of the game. I think it's uh, I think we understand that. Yes, Professor. Yeah, uh, let me add a new direction to this, uh, all this talk about rights. And, uh, I think basically at the, at the basic level of it, rights are things that are contended in a society, and it's inevitable that when you contend over rights, you must enter the political process, which is why you pose a question, what if, what if the gay issue becomes an opposition issue? Would it cause us discomfort? I would like, I would like, that, yeah, I would like that question. Okay. Um, I would say that it's not just the gay people. I, I have worked with other NGOs on other issues. And I would say that getting a sense of it, a lot of NGOs in Singapore are frightened of entering the electoral <coughs> process. That's why during our general elections, civil society is not there contending. It's not there telling the MPs, hey, listen, this is my pet issue. If you want my vote, you better tell me what time you stand on it. You are shy away from it. And that is one unhealthy aspect of Singapore politics. I think we should be out there. Is it true, Professor, that in some other mature democracies, uh, NGOs actually endorse candidates? Precisely. So, so it's not just the gay people. I think the cat lovers. Um, the, <laughs> the environmental issue. For me, the, the people who are championing uh, foreign workers like, should be out there, should be getting to the TAPs and the opposition party. Where do you stand on this issue where I, I strongly believe in? If you want my vote, I want you to work for it. And I think we inject that element to our general election, you'll probably see a very different political landscape that will be a lot more healthy than what we have now. Having said that, I would say if you base what, uh, what you just said about the gay policy, uh, the gay issue from different political parties. Yeah, I think TAP MPs are probably restrained by an overall party policy. 
Now that's why I'm not sure where the opposition stand on this. Is that maybe they have a looser level of control. Uh, they have less to lose. That's why they, they know they're not probably going to win the most cases. So no harm. Now when they get into power, that's when. That's when you maybe have a different level of politics. So I'm just tabling on this issue for discussion for consideration. With some of my colleagues um, and some of my students, we did a nationally representative survey of situations about their views about gays and lesbians and about media coverage, uh, the appearance of gays and lesbians in the media. And I mean, to take issue with, with all due respect, to take issue with what you say about religious extremists being the ones who are the main problem. I mean, what we found in a national representative survey with over a thousand respondents was that 69% of Singaporeans have negative views about gays and lesbians. So, I mean, this is, this is a lot of people that should know. Um, I, I don't know that the problem uh, can be reduced to religious extremism. I think it's, you know, people that all of us know. Um, when I ask my students about these issues, I find that there is not uh, a rights culture at all here. What people think is we have to let the rest of the society catch up. We have to wait till people approve of gay men and lesbians before they get granted their rights. It's not a rights culture where, okay, you're a minority, but still you have the right to do what you want. It's nothing like that. Even among some of my most articulate students, it's quite the opposite. It's like we have to wait till the old generation dies off. <laughs> Rights. For example, like a Malay jazz singer who is lesbian needs to be re represented in parliament. Okay, I, I don't know this then. I think the issue is at a broader context of the issue of human rights, of we have the rights to be present. And I think unless that issue, uh, if one goes into specific human rights of our specific issues, then all pockets of society need to be represented. And that may not be extremely practical. Okay, looking at the situation. But so one has got to look at the lowest denominator, for example, as what is a person's rights to express himself, in this case in terms of sexual preference and in terms of human relationship and in terms of love. And unless that issue is being tackled as a basic denominator, I don't think we can progress in any other issues, your rights for handicaps, your rights for uh, uh, minorities, uh, foreign workers' rights, it cannot be addressed at any other level unless the basic human denominator be addressed. Okay, now, before we move on, most of you are sitting tired standing. I deliberately left that here alone so you can sit here and try to be seriously to Yeah, okay. Right, now let's move on. Come on, let's move on. 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 Okay, let's move on. Okay, right. <laughs> Similar picture because there were so many people there. Surely I'm not the only one of the 